A young army brat sits in an Americanized diner in Germany, doing her homework. A man walks up to her and asks her if she would like to come to a party over the weekend and meet a famous person. She gets her parents' permission and goes. At this party, she meets this older man. During their conversation, the man asks her if she's a senior or junior in high school. She shyly says, I'm in ninth. Ninth what? The man responds with a smile. This is the beginning of the Elvis and Priscilla relationship. Sofia Coppola's new film does not shy away from the uncomfortable aspect of the love story at the center of Priscilla. She was 14 and he was 24 when they first met. The film also doesn't shy away from depicting how a young girl could be swept away by the idea of the most famous man in the world being infatuated by her. We watch a girl's wildest dreams come true in the dimly lit and muted reality of this film. Priscilla is the antithesis of last year's visual vomitorium Elvis, directed by walking Adderall tablet Baz Luhrmann. The glamour is stripped down to its barest essentials, as it's shown that most of the time Priscilla didn't get to see much of the spotlight, the bright marquees, the scores of adoring fans. She lived a solitary life at Graceland, spending most of her time alone. When the love of her life was around, she was treated more like an object for his use, an accessory used to sell the image of the king of rock and roll. Sofia Coppola frames Priscilla within the walls of Graceland like a bird inside a gilded cage. Early in the film, she is chastised for playing with her new puppy outside. She is told to not make a display of herself near the gate where devoted fans wait to catch a glimpse of the king. Is it for her own safety? Or does the Elvis management team not want the allure of a bachelor Elvis to go away? Or is it simply to keep reports of an underage girl at Graceland low? Priscilla meanders around the house, her wings clipped. She is framed with a lot of empty space all around her. She's too small for this larger-than-life world and doesn't seem like she'll grow into it. When Elvis is around with his posse constantly at his side, they always fill up the screen, while reverse shots of Priscilla keep her small. She plays dress-up for them at fashion stores. Their leering comments pierce the audio. Fourteen years of a woman's life is told in less than two hours, a seemingly impossible task if not for the Herculean efforts by Sarah Flack, who has been Sofia Coppola's editor since Lost in Translation. Much of the film consists of montage, Beautiful sequences of a young girl depressed that the love of her life has gone away. A maid setting down trays of food to imply a couple in the throes of passion that lasts over days. Sometimes the editing would shift in a new direction and have a single shot encapsulate weeks and even months of time to heartbreaking effectiveness. The shots within the montage would typically consist of beautifully composed tableaus, getting everything across without the use of a single word. Kaylee Spaney and Jacob Elordi both shine as the leads in this film, Spaney gives a nuanced performance, letting her eyes do most of the heavy lifting. She physically expresses her character's inner turmoil in subtle gestures and looks. She is also given time to deliver emotional power through justified outbursts. But these moments of melodrama are not the focus, and Coppola uses them only when necessary. Jacob Elordi is having a very good year playing supporting roles. His work as Elvis is exceptional, and the continuous strive for Elordi to find the flawed human being in Elvis sets his portrayal above Austin Butler's last year. The film's costumes and set design were beautiful when the image was bright enough to see anything. Heavy shadows lay all around Graceland, turning the patterned wallpaper and odd Elvis knickknacks into something more ominous. For such a small budget, it's quite impressive how many iconic Elvis and Priscilla outfits they were able to display. The copyright owners of Elvis's work refused to give the film any permission to use his songs, so Coppola and music supervisor Randall Poster had to get creative. Utilizing songs from every decade, we are given an insight to Priscilla's world with the use of music that was influenced by the man she married. We are also able to create a universality with using songs from multiple decades. So we don't just see Priscilla as a girl from the 60s, but a girl anyone could know from any time. Unfortunately, something kept me distant from the emotional heart of Priscilla. I found myself more of a passive viewer than emotionally invested in the characters. I was able to appreciate the style and execution of the film as a whole, but I never really felt the journey. Possibly the film's dedication to playing in a minor key meant it needed more of an effort from the audience, which is not a bad thing, just not something I was prepared for.